Welcome everyone to today's radical exchange between Yuval Noah Harari and Audrey Tang. I'm Pooja Olhaber and I'm very humbled to be part of this conversation. The title of today's conversation is To Be Hacked or Not To Be Hacked, The Future of Identity, Work and Democracy. Joining me from Israel is Yuval. He is a gay historian and author of three wildly popular books, which you've probably heard of or read. The first one is Sapiens, which is a history of our distant past. The second one is Homo Deus, which is about our distant future. And the most recent book is 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, which is about today. Also joining me is Audrey Tang from Taiwan. Audrey is the first digital minister of Taiwan, also the first transgendered member of the Taiwanese cabinet. Audrey is also an artist, an hacktivist, and also an anarchist. So given that we're still in Pride Month, I'd like to start the conversation today about gender identity and in particular, ask both of you about your process of self-discovery uh, in your own gender identities and how that has influenced your view of technology. Yuval, we'll start with you. So um, the process of realizing that I'm gay and coming out really shaped my attitude, not just towards technology, but towards science and the history in general. It first made me realize how little uh, people can know about themselves I came out, I realized that I was gay when only when I was 21. And for years, I mean, I look back at the time when I was 15 or 16, and I just really can't understand it. I mean, it should have been extremely obvious that I'm attracted to boys and not to girls. But, and you know, I think I'm an intelligent person. I should have figured it out, but I just didn't. It took me, it was kind of a split in my mind that I didn't know this about myself. And this is why today, when I look at the development of new surveillance technology, one of the things that most interests me is what happens when somebody out there can know me better than I know myself. I'm quite sure that if Facebook or TikTok or whatever existed, and when I was a teenager, they could find out I was gay in like two seconds, long, long before I knew that about myself. And what does it mean to live in a world when a corporation or a government can know something so important about me that I don't know about myself? And this is one of the big questions I have today about technology and its impact on politics and society. Uh, Audrey. Uh, can you tell us about your process? Certainly. Um, so um, I will first um, acknowledge that uh, Taiwan is one of the very few, maybe the only jurisdiction now in the world to hold a physical parade a couple of days ago and yesterday too, uh, of the Gay Pride and Transgender and LGBTIQ Rights March. Uh, in Taiwan, it's only been one year since we uh, legalized marriage equality, the first in Asia, uh, by adopting a very uh, innovative way of legalizing the bylaws, but not the in-laws, meaning that in the legal code, uh, we make sure that when two same-sex um, couples wed, they wed as individuals with all the same uh, rights and duties, but they are families because in Mandarin, we have eight different names for aunts and uncles. Uh, these are not affected. Um, and so this, uh, to me, signifies something that I feel uh, very personally when I was uh, a teenager, because my natural testosterone level is that of maybe a 80-year-old male uh, human being, uh, meaning that uh, I'm somewhere between the average male adolescence and average female adolescent's testosterone level when I was uh, 13 or 14 years old. And so I was uh, very lucky at the time to have discovered uh, the World Web, uh, the internet, and a lot of gender non-binary and gender queer 
career people who informs me that even though I may be alone in my neighborhood of say 100 people, um, actually even if this is just one in 100, one in 1,000, that means that there's millions of us <laughs> on the internet that can form such a uh, non-binary kind of support group uh, to make sure that our own lived in experiences can be shared freely. Later on, when I was um, 24 years old, I would go through the second puberty, the female puberty, um, which lasts for another uh, two or three years. Uh, and so it enables me as someone who works in um, as a poetician, <laughs> uh, making sure that uh, I understand, empathize with all the different sides, because in my mind, there is no half of the world that's different from me. Uh, I can empathize with other people's lifting experience because I've been through the different puberties as well. So when we um, legalized marriage equality, I think it really is a innovation when we discover this intergenerational um, way of reconciling our different positions, uh, the older generation relying on family and more group values, community values, and the younger generation more individualistic uh, values. Uh, but in our um, legal code, we make sure that we, we respect both uh, traditions in a transcultural way. So I often uh, just translate the official name of the, our country as a transcultural republic of citizens, and that also constitutes my main work. Great, thank you. Aji, do you worry about the situation which you've all described where technology can uh, you know, know ourselves better than we know ourselves and before we know ourselves? Um, a lot of uh, my work is to ensure that social sectors uh, and in radical exchange terms, uh, a data coalition or a data cooperative uh, owns uh, the means of production, in this case, the production, uh, production of data. Uh, that is to say, if people produce data in a way that is passive, uh, that enables uh, a surveillance state or surveillance capitalism, and that will lead to the scenario uh, where uh, Yuval was uh, very much uh, articulated uh, in his worries. But if the social sector, that is to say, if ordinary citizens um, can understand that uh, they're collecting, for example, in Taiwan, the leading uh, contact tracing technology winner of our coronavirus, hackers on the lock board. Uh, they collect the whereabouts, their temperature, their symptoms, and so on, but it never transmits anywhere. It keeps it strictly within their phone and not anywhere else. And when the contact tracers, the medical officers, comes uh, to investigate, it generates a one-time link that have exactly the kind of information that contact tracing needs without divulging any private details about their friends and families as would often be revealed by a traditional contact tracing interview. This is just a very simple example, but this shows the autonomous nature of uh, people when they're owning their own data, when they're sharing it only with their most intimate and trusted friends and families. And together, this intersectional data collaborative can prove to be much more powerful than any forced, please install this application uh, technology that a state or the uh, multinational um, companies uh, can have an effect on the society. And so I would argue that Taiwan's successful counter pandemic is based on this kind of social sector collaboratives that owns the data and does not store it in the quote unquote cloud, but rather uh, only in each other's personal devices. Maybe if I can say something about that. Um... I definitely don't believe in technological determinism. I don't think that the kind of either surveillance capitalism or the uh, surveillance totalitarianism that we see developing in some countries, whether it's in the US or in China, whether this is an inevitable outcome of the current technological breakthrough, I think it's a big danger. Uh, the biggest danger really is the rise of a new kind of totalitarianism that we have never seen before in history, simply because it's now technically feasible to follow everybody all the time. You know, even in the darkest moments of the 20th century, in Stalin's Russia or in Mao's China, it was simply technically impossible to follow everybody all the time and to know them better than you know yourself. If you need a government, a policeman, government agent, KGB agent to follow everybody 24 hours a day, you don't have enough agents. And even if you have all the agents, um, they just produce paper reports about what you do. 
Somebody needs to read the reports and analyze them. That's impossible. Now it's becoming feasible, technically, to do that because you don't need human agents. You have all the sensors and cameras and microphones, and you don't need human analysts. You have AI and machine learning and so forth. Uh, so it is becoming a possibility, but it's not inevitable. I think if we take the right actions, like what's being done in Taiwan, that can make the, uh, this dystopian scenario um, uh, prevent it from happening. And we saw it in the 20th century, that you can use the same technology to build completely different kinds of regimes. You just need to look at South Korea and North Korea, same people, same geography, same history, same culture, using the same technology in a completely different way. Um, but an even deeper question is, what happens, let's say we succeed in preventing the rise of digital dictatorships when some government follows us all the time and knows everything about it? What happens if the data is really collected in a responsible and secure way, it serves us and not the government or some big corporation? Still, the deep philosophical question is, even in this situation, authority, is likely to shift away from humans to algorithms in the most important decisions on, of our life, like what to study or where to work or whom to marry. It's not that I have this all-knowing government that forces me to do something. It's just that I know the algorithm knows me far better than I know myself and can make recommendations for me and I increasingly just rely on what the algorithm tells me. I, it improves all the time. The algorithm doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be better on average than, the, uh, than me in making these decisions. And gradually, the authority will shift. And philosophically, I think this is the really big question of, of our time. Uh, even if we prevent the dystopian scenario of digital dictatorships, how do we deal with democratic algorithms that serve us, but still know us better than we know ourselves? So maybe we ignore the outline and I would just comment on that uh, viewpoint. Yeah, for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to say code. But when I say code, please think algorithm. Uh, so code is, is having, of course, the kind of impact as you all describe it. Because code is like law, but it's not a law of text. It's like a law of physics uh, and cyberspace because code determine what can happen, what cannot happen. Technically, not cannot happen, but very uh, it takes a lot of effort, like being a professional hacker, <laughs> to make it happen. For most people, it's just uh, it cannot happen because it's pre-regulated by the code, and so it also regulates what is transparent. For example, code can make the state transparent to the citizen, as Taiwan does, or it can make citizen transparent to the state, as the PR does and, and things like that. And so it, every time that we deploy code as part of our society, it establishes a normativity that is um, tells us what's legal, what's even thinkable uh, by design, just like physics. You cannot even think of, uh, oh, I'm going to violate a physics law today uh, because that's just not how, how the world works. Right? So that basically has a very different position than our current text-based normativity. When you can do like civil disobedience, you willfully occupy the parliament as we did in 2014. Uh, and then you argue it's legal and you convince the judges. And so the impact, as you've all said, is that it, whenever we deploy code, we must have the same kind of access to justice, to the same kind of access to the open futures, to the different interpretations that's either agreed by the social norm, which would be a positive impact, or it would be set by a few people and basically uh, restrict everybody else's imagination, which would have a negative social impact, even if it is not by one or two actors, even if it's by you know tens of thousands of programmers, that still is a kind of uh, restriction and to me also a negative social impact. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's an extremely important point, this comparison between code and physics, um, because a lot of people today still don't get it. 
the enormous power of coders to actually shape reality. So yes, coders can't change the uh, E equals NC square. We can't change that. But social reality is increasingly constructed by these codes. You know, it starts with very, very simple thing. Like you have these, even in the old days, like you go to a government minister and you need to fill up some form and you have to, then the, the, somebody decided that on the form, you, will have, you have to check male or female. And these are the only two options. And in order to, to fill in your application or your form or whatever, you have to tick one. And because somebody decided, some functionary decided that the form will have only these two options, then this is now your reality. If you say, yeah, no, I, I, I often tickle both, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then again, I mean, in some, in some systems, you can't just tick both. If it's paper, paper is still in a way, that's a good example, because paper in a way is still more enabling. I mean, if you're creative, you get this government form on paper and you tick both boxes, wonderful. But if it's on a computer, then somebody coded the, the, the form in such a way that no, you can only tick once. And unless you tick, it doesn't go on to the next screen or whatever. So, and this is now your reality. And maybe it's some 22 year old guy in California who did it without even thinking too deeply that he is making this deep philosophical and ethical and, and political decision that will have an impact on the lives of, of people all over the world. And you can see it when you input the emoji, that is to say, uh, like in the movie Arrival, uh, those very abstract symbols that we all use to communicate now. Uh, and uh, for a very long time, the default emojis are all male. Uh, and you have to pass a gender selector uh, for it to look like a woman. Uh, and just in very recent years, like in the past year or two, did the uh, multinationals uh, and the Unicode consortium, actually, the standard, the code makers started to say, no, uh, the default uh, personnel, the laughing with uh, joyful laughter, uh, with joyful tears face, need to look gender neutral. Uh, by default. And you, if you want it to look like a boy or like a girl, you have to do additional work and it must be the same amount of work to make it like, look like a boy and like a girl. So I think that is uh, the kind of norm that I'm saying that uh, the code makers, if it doesn't allow for future interpretations, if the maker of the checkboxes doesn't allow for a other or uh, non-binary choice, which by the way, Taiwan provides for people uh, arriving <laughs> to our area airports when you're doing the health check mm -hmm. form, uh, then uh, if you don't design that in, then of course you would then rely on people who are civic hackers, meaning that they imagine different civic uh, futures uh, to patch it in. However, Taiwan is the only jurisdiction in Asia that has the complete freedom of assembly of speech and so on, so civic hackers will not be punished un unduly. In every other place in Asia, just let, like uh, same-sex marriage is not possible, <laughs> this kind of civic hacking can often get people in trouble. And to me, that reflects how much a society is willing to look at its algorithmic code as flexible as its legal code with a due process of change. This issue of, of the, again, the, the, the difference between natural law that shapes our life and the, the rules that we invent, it's one of the main themes of history. Of course, every culture, every religion claims that they rule their laws, uh, the laws of nature, but and those who break the law are doing something unnatural. But this is obviously wrong because, as, as you said, if, if, if a law is really natural, you simply cannot break it. So if some religion comes and says, uh, for two men to love one another, or for two women to get married with, with one another, this is unnatural, this is by definition wrong. A real natural law, like you can't move faster than the speed of light, you simply can't break it. It's not up to you. Obviously, biology and physics enable two women to love each other or to have sex with one another. It's only human code which says, no, 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 this is, this is wrong. 
we don't want to allow it. And you know, the, the good thing in a way about computer code is that in many cases, even though of course computer code has inside it a lot of biases, either programmed intentionally by human engineers or programmed unintentionally, still the good thing about computer code is that in essence, it can be corrected much more easily. If a human being has a bias against, say, gay people or against black people, you can explain to that, you can discover, oh, this person or this system, the courts have a bias. And you can explain it to people and people can even agree. And that will not be enough to change the bias because the bias comes from someplace far deeper than our conscious intelligence. It comes from our subconscious. Now, in computer code, uh, you can say computers don't have a subconscious. If you find what's where in the code, the bias is encoded, and you change that, in a way, it's much easier to make a computer code gay-friendly or LGBT-friendly than to make a human being change the, the deep biases. So this is an interesting point. Audrey, uh, you mentioned in a previous talk in the recent COVID crisis, uh, this example of pink masks and uh, the, how, how civ civ technolo civic technology actually facilitated gender mainstreaming and could support that and, and actually go deep into our biases. Can you tell us a little bit about that example? Certainly. Um, so in Taiwan, uh, while we say the social innovation, the, our pandemic response system <clears throat> is based on the uh, three pillars of fast, fair and fun. Uh, and the fast part is the collective intelligence system that literally rely on the most um, ancient communication technology that is the landline. Uh, and so anyone with a telephone, uh, smart or not, uh, can uh, dial 1922, which is a simple landline number, uh, and it's uh, toll free, and tell whatever they want to tell uh, to the Central Epidemic Command Center, the CECC. And uh, uh, one day in April, there was a young boy who said, oh, uh, in our district, because we ration uh, medical masks at a time, when you ration masks, you don't get to pick the color. It just so happens that uh, all his uh, rations was in pink um, color. And so uh, he was afraid to go to school saying that my classmate may bully me or laugh at me uh, for wearing pink medical mask. And so I think one of his friends called 1922 to tell the CECC of this problem. Uh, and the very next day in our daily live stream press conference where the CECC answers all the journalists' questions, you can see every medical officer, regardless of gender, start wearing pink medical mask. And that immediately gained uh, national popularity. A lot of um, the uh, avatars of famous people and famous pages gets uh, turned pink. Pink suddenly became the, the most hip color. Uh, and so then it teaches about gender mainstreaming. And I think this uh, just made everybody a little bit more transgender, which uh, I think is a good idea. Uh, and so <laughs> the, the point here is that if the norm, people feel that they have a stake in the norm and just with a simple phone call and regardless of age i mean that boy probably isn't of legal age uh, probably isn't 18 years old but just through this simple phone call and convincing uh, in a very um, natural manner uh, and appealing to the cecc's idea of mask for all um, if a few boys doesn't wear mask uh, because it's pink, then it actually is a public health threat to everybody else as well. Uh, and because of that, they took on this gender mainstreaming role very quickly within 24 hours. And this fast iteration cycle, this agile response, then makes the social sector more strong and more robust because everybody, instead of waiting for the command from the command center, they can actually just participate in the code making. Um, basically, wearing a mask is a kind of code. And what this code signifies is that it protects myself from my own hands in Taiwan. So I'm uh, taking care of my own health, I'm washing my hands properly, I wear a mask to remind myself that, and also remind other people to protect themselves as well. And that idea have a higher R value 
than other ideas. For example, wear a mask to protect others, to respect others, and so on. And pink medical ads just add to the hip factor of wearing a mask. So altogether, this increase may be the R value of ideas, of memes, even more uh, than uh, it was before. And so uh, the CECC is in charge of amplifying those pro-social ideas. And this uh, is what I mean by Republic of Citizens. It seems like, uh, Audrey, your view is uh, to take technology and, and use code to uh, help us, uh, assist us, right? So assistive intelligence. Um, and, and Yuval, uh, you're, you, you worry ab uh, about, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like you worry about code codifying our, uh, our say, existing biases. Mm -hmm. But Audrey, your solution seems to uh, be a, a participatory uh, uh, framework combined with fast iterations. Is that how you would, you would characterize the solution? Yeah, definitely. And and it also must be fair and also fun, which I will get to later. Uh, but the fast part, yes, it's essential because if uh, the government only responds with those what we call patches, right, fixes to the system, if we respond only every year or even every four years uh, in case of uh, votes and elections, which is like three bits uploaded every four years, uh, then there's just not sufficient signal uh, to correct a previously uh, biased or wrong code. Uh, but if everybody can very freely fork, that is to say, develop alternate visions and also merge within a 24-hour uh, cycle, then something magical happens. Uh, it enables the few civic technologists to become like civil engineers because their work will be then used by over half of population, which makes this code makers the same kind of role as the highway makers, the road makers, and so on, but with the additional benefit of everybody being able to imagine imagine different futures. And if it gets rough consensus, that is to say, if a lot of people can live with it, then it just turns into the overall new reality for the society in a very rapid fashion, like from pink being sissy to pink being very hip and cool. It's literally just 24 hours. Hmm. Well, I think that the main issue for me, again, from a historical perspective, is that democracy gives authority to the desires and feelings of people. I mean, this is the ultimate authority in a democracy. And I completely agree that letting people voice their desires, their feelings just once in four years is certainly not enough. It's not efficient. But the big challenge we are facing and will increasingly face in the 21st century is that now there is the technology to hack human beings and therefore also to increasingly manipulate their desires and emotions. Of course, throughout history, uh, kings and emperors and prophets and religions, they always tried to get inside people's minds, understand what's happening there and manipulate it. And we saw in history mass movements of manipulation, again, like the totalitarian movements of the 20th century, but ultimately it wasn't, um, it was inefficient, not only because we, they didn't have the technology that I discussed earlier to really follow everybody all the time. Also the, the main obstacle was simply the lack of biological knowledge. We didn't, humans didn't understand human biology, the human brain well enough to really understand what's happening there. So in the end, humans remained like black boxes that even somebody like Stalin or Mao or Hitler couldn't really figure out what's happening there. And now it's not just the breakthrough in computer science, but it's the same time the breakthrough in the biological sciences that are opening up this black box. They are enabling to, again, hack human beings, understand what's happening inside, and therefore open completely new ways of manipulation. And once you have something like that, the ability to manipulate on scale the desires and emotions and feelings of millions of people, then simply having fast, faster iteration of feedback 
is not necessarily enough. And again, the, the full ability to hack human beings, it's still in the future. We are still not there yet. But even what's been happening in the last few years is alarming. The, really, you have all these and algorithms and, and apps and devices that what they are really about is, is hacking human beings. You have the smartest people in the world working on this problem of how to push our emotional buttons. Like you have the big corporation and they say, look, people are spending 30 minutes a day on our uh, app on our device, on our platform, we want them to spend one hour. This is your mission for this year. And they, they, they take the smartest people in the world and give them this task, how to hijack people's attention and keep them on our platform. And these smartest people in the world discovered how to press our emotional buttons, the fear button, the hate button, the greed button. And this is the easiest way to grab people's attention. And looking to the future, again, I mean, the threat of a rising dictatorship, a new kind of dictatorship is a big one. But even if we avoid that, how to deal with the new tools for hacking the human brain, the human mind, that's the, the really big uh, uh, question. Again, because Taking the example I began this interview with, if I think about myself when I was, say, 14, and this algorithm analyzes my behavior, just you say analyzes what, where my eyes go, like I walk down the beach, and the algorithm analyzes if I focus on uh, cute guys or cute girls, or it analyzes what, my, what happens to my eyes when I watch... Uh, videos or television or whatever, and it discovers that uh, I like boys more than girls, and it tells it to me, or it uses it to manipulate me in, in some way. So, you know, if it's a bad manipulation, like Coca-Cola is using this knowledge to sell me something I don't need, they show me commercials with sexy guys, so I buy their product, and I don't know why, then they are using it against me. But the really big issue is, what if the algorithm isn't uh, malign? It's not working in the service of some corporation. And I don't know this about myself, but the algorithm knows it. There is kind of an imbalance here. And what happens then? I mean, should it tell me that I'm gay? Should it kind of expose me slowly to different contents that will enable me to realize this about myself? I mean, what is the proper kind of relationship with this kind of entity? I'll say one, one more, more, more thing. We had this kind of entity throughout history in a way. Uh, mother or father or teacher. My mother is somebody who when I was 14, maybe she didn't know I was gay, but she knew a lot of things about me I didn't realize. But my mother had th my best interests in mind when thinking how to use this information about me. And we have thousands of years of experience in building the kind of beneficial parent-child relationship. Now we are suddenly creating a completely new kind of entity who actually knows about me far more even than my mother and we have no cultural or historical traditions about what kind of relationship I have with my AI mentor that has all this information about me. And I, I don't want this to sound dystopian or utopian. It's just fascinating as a historian to think what kind of relationships will emerge out of this new technology. Yes, uh, to this point, actually, there were two points, right? One is the lack of accountability. There was the Coca-Cola example. And one was the uh, value alignment, uh, which is uh, all watched over by machines of loving grace, uh, right? So uh, the, the first point is easier to address. Um, Taiwan, uh, in our previous presidential election, uh, managed to establish a norm uh, through a completely independent branch of the government called the uh, control. 
Yuan or the control branch uh, that makes the campaign donation and campaign expenses radically transparent, meaning the raw data is published for independent journalists to analyze. And they've been doing this because we, the civic uh, hacktivists, have been petitioning this, even doing acts of civil disobedience uh, for that. And so when we really started doing that um, back in the mayoral election in 2018, we discovered that there's a large chunk missing. The social media advertisements, these were not reported as campaign donations, neither as expenses. And many of them maybe came from outside Taiwan, and we don't know. It really is an unaccountable black box. And we read, of course, about the reports about how some foreign powers interfered with some other countries' elections using hyper-precision targeting technology, exactly the kind that Yuval um, described, right? It predicts uh, in a micro-prediction way uh, what people's kind of hidden uh, fears and hopes are, and they cater to those fears and hopes. And just target this very tiny slice of people uh, trying to persuade them to not go to vote or to avoid certain kind of candidate or do some kind of emotional manipulation. And so we tell the, all the multinationals that, okay, look at our control yuan. This radical transparency is the Taiwanese norm. And you have two choices. You can either publish your real-time advertisement library just as our control yuan does in radical transparency so people engaging in such dark manipulations will be discovered and shamed. Or you can just simply not run political and social um, advertisement during our election session, your choice. And we did not pass a law for that. We basically just let them know there will be social sanctions uh, if you violate the control UN norm, the, our election norm. And so Facebook decided to radically open their ads library, uh, while Google and Twitter and so on just simply refused to run political advertisements during our election. So that is a very neat example to uh, the accountability issue, which is a more, to me, minor issue. The value alignment issue is much larger. Uh, just as uh, our mothers, fathers, uh, and community members may all offer interpretations. That is to say, their such advice to us, of course, have our own best interest uh, in mind, are nevertheless colored by their life experiences. And mm -hmm. even though those interpretations may be valid, they also, to a growing teenager, forecloses certain other possibilities uh, because that's the power of interpretation. And so to me, I think uh, a way to uh, free ourselves from this value alignment issue is just to have uh, as a norm multiple interpretations, just as you can have many human assistants each perfectly value aligned to you and make accountable explanation wherever do they do some decision not in your best interest, you will have those different uh, human assistants um, compare notes. And if one of them consistently makes things that are not value aligned to you, at least you have other assistants to warn you about. And I think this plurality instead of a singularity um, vision is what I have written in my own job description. Like instead of user experience, we need to think about human experience because when we think about user experience i know some other industry who also use the term user uh, you only care about the time that you spent addicted uh, with that technology when you use the term user uh, is a zero-sum game of attention and time span but if you think of the total human experience then these different interpretations may add to one another and eventually liberate oneself uh, from one singular vision of oneself yeah i agree that the one way um, to deal with this issue is to have this plurality of uh, actors and viewpoints. And funnily enough, you know, when, when people think about algorithms taking over, they, they most fear about democracies. Um, and democracies are vulnerable in things like election manipulations. But people don't realize that in the long run, when you talk about algorithms really taking over, not in a science fiction way, of the robots rebelling and trying to kill us, but of algorithms actually gathering more and more power to themselves. So even if you still have a human president or a human prime minister, actually all the important decisions are the, being taken by an algorithm that the prime minister cannot even understand. Like the algorithm comes to the PM 
and tells, look, there is a huge financial crisis about to happen and we must do this. But I can't explain to you why, because your brain just can't analyze all the data that I have gathered. So even though the PM is still the officially the one in charge, actually it's the algorithm running the show. And this is increasingly happening. And the funny thing is that dictatorships are actually far more vulnerable to this kind of algorithmic takeover. Uh, if you think about, say, the PRC, I often think about maybe if I had time to write a science fiction novel or a science fiction movie about algorithms taking over, my favorite setting will actually be, let's say, the Communist Party of the PRC. What happens, imagine, if the party gives algorithms increasing control over the appointment of lower ranking officials. Not the people to the Politburo, this is too political, it's too complicated, but let's say appointing the, the, all the officials in the local cities and branches and so forth. This is increasingly done by an algorithm that constantly follows all the, I don't know, 80 million members of the Communist Party and collects data and analyzes it and learns from experience. And very soon, Nobody in the, PR, in, in, the, in the Communist Party actually understands why the algorithm is deciding to appoint this person or to advance that person, but they trust the algorithm. And very soon, the algorithm basically takes over the party. Even if one day the Politburo wakes up and says, oh, no, 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 it's gone too far. We've lost control. It's too late for them because the algorithm has already appointed all the uh, lower ranking members. And this kind of algorithmic takeover, which I think is far, far more likely than the science fiction scenarios of a robot rebellion, this can actually happen far more easily in an authoritarian regime than in a democratic regime. Uh, you just, the, the, the only ingredient missing is for the people higher up to develop enough trust uh, in the algorithm. In a democracy, you need to convince millions of people to trust the algorithm in order for the algorithm to take over. In an authoritarian regime, you just need to convince a handful of people which are already primed to accept this kind of logic that there is somebody who collects all the information and knows best. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I, th th that's just, you know, one possible scenario. But, but the really deep problem of value alignment is that even if, if you have a democracy and you have many players, as the algorithms get to know us better and as we listen to them in more and more decisions in life, they increasingly also control the, our own values. And that's especially true if they accompany us from an early age. Like I'm now 44, so my values are, uh, have been shaped by decades of experience. And if, I, if an algorithm now increasingly makes decision for me, the algorithm will still find it difficult to change my core values. But if you start with a baby or a young child and more and more decisions about the life of that child are taken by an AI mentor, again, not, a, not an, a, an evil mentor that actually serves some corporation, but a mentor which is supposedly really serving the interests of that child, but it learns on the way, it changes, and you don't really know, uh, you, you trust the algorithm, but you don't really know what, where are these decisions coming from? A human can't go over all the data and understand it. And these decisions also shape the values of the child as she or he is growing up. So again, I, I, I don't have a fixed opinion about it. I don't think it's dystopia or utopia. I just think it's a completely new kind of situation that as a historian fascinates me. 
one of the ideas in radical exchange is data dignity. And, and uh, Audrey, you alluded to it earlier uh, at the start of the conversation in the architecture. And um, and I think one of the things sort of to consider here is how, how can we uh, architect uh, algorithms so we have this plurality. And data dignity, I think, is useful. Now, and the idea of data dignity is that you separate control and use of the data, right? So once you when you separate those two, you ultimately are breaking, you know, the monopoly and monopsony on data that big tech and big governments have. If you do that and you separate control and use, then you can imagine that there's going to be um, lots of sort of different data cooperatives or collectives which can uh, accept or reject algorithms, right? And we will see, you can imagine a plurality of algorithms um, on top of a plurality of these collectives, which we choose from. Um, Audrey, do you think that that's a compelling uh, vision of the future that could solve some of the problems uh, which, which you've always worried about? The idea of a single mentor uh, presupposes a kind of linear development path. Uh, and as a junior high school dropout, I have no personal experience with linear path. Uh, and so um, I hear people uh, have attended this thing called university. Uh, but in any case, uh, what I'm trying to get to uh, is that um, really in, in Taiwan, our new curriculum starting last year uh, invites the children to set their own uh, projects to solve uh, structural problems by problem-based learning. And teachers, uh, it could be institutional, it could be in the community college, it could be um, in the local um, like elderly uh, learning groups and so on, uh, indigenous uh, language circles and so on. These are the different circles uh, that this child, when they care, for example, about climate change, they can reach out to the various circles interested in that thing instead of relying on the textbook teaching them the truths and facts uh, about climate science, which doesn't make sense unless you have a compelling motivation to understand and solve this problem, right? So the idea of a motivational, self-motivational learning is at the core of our new curriculum. And this is after decades of alternative experimental homeschooling, uh, all sorts of different education experiments in Taiwan, which are legal, all of them, uh, up to 10% of Taiwanese uh, young people can choose their own curriculum free of the official one for the past uh, decade or so. And after we learned from what worked and what didn't, we decided that um, this kind of autonomous joining the circles that tackle the same problem is the best way to free uh, from individual to individual competition, which tend to dominate East Asian education uh, thought. Uh, and once uh, you get trapped into that linear growth, then of course you will have, um, you know, the first place, second place, third place, as if on the same runner's track. But if you're attracted by a systemic problem that you seek to solve, then you basically choose your own course and you win at the starting point, I guess. Uh, and then you meet other people who are also kind of forming new constellations from all the different disciplines and all the different cultures in a transcultural way. And in this way, everybody you meet will kind of be in a very different culture. And they probably don't agree with each other uh, about their worldviews and their algorithms. Um, if they empower themselves with augmented reality or assistive intelligence, will probably have very different values. And then the child will be able then to form, in a sense, their own constellation. And so I think this is what the radical exchange idea of inter sectional data um, really shines in the sense of uh, oneself, we define me as really just a bunch of hashtags. The more dimensions that I explore, of course, the more unique this combination is. But at the end, it's just a plurality of hashtags that I associate myself to and therefore curate the kind of data that's useful to these different ideas or different values, but all the while uh, remaining true to my own chosen combination of this constellation. And that's, uh, I think, at the core of the data dignity idea. Yeah, I, I I, I think that the kind of ideas of an, an, a kind of AI mentor doesn't imply a single trajectory uh, or a particular value system, uh, just the opposite. I mean, it, it can actually encourage 
exploration and wide breadth of, of, uh, of interest, even more than traditional education systems. If you think about something like, I don't know, music. So let's say I have a particular musical taste. Now, one vision of the algorithmic sidekick or the algorithmic men mentor is that the AI learns what I like and just gives me more and more of that and kind of imprisons me in the cocoon or the prison of my own previous biases and opinions. But the opposite view is that no, because it knows me so well, it also knows the best way to expose me to, let's say, new mus musical tastes. It can even calculate the, I don't know, sometimes when you try too much, then it backfires. So it knows that, oh, I don't know, that 10% uh, uh, of the music that it gives me would be from genres or traditions that I myself would never think of trying. And it can also know the best moment in the day or the week when I'm most open to new experiences. In the traditional way of school, you go to music class. So music class is every Tuesday at 11 o'clock. That's it. And this is when you are supposed to be exposed to new kinds of music. But maybe on Tuesday at 11 o'clock, I'm very tired or I'm concerned about something. And this is the worst moment to try and introduce me to jazz or to Indonesian gamelan music. But the AI will know that actually at seven o'clock in the evening on that particular day, I'm much more open. So it, it will try then. In this way, hacking human beings does not necessarily mean imprisoning them in their own previous preferences and biases, it can lead to an um, unprecedented variety and exploration. So it can really go in, in, in a lot of different ways. I completely agree. Uh, when I said uh, linear progression, I merely refer uh, to the kind of singular uh, pronoun that you're referring the AI with, the, the it, right, instead yeah. of uh, they, which also could be singular. But anyway, uh, what I'm trying to say um, is that, uh, for example, uh, my personal phone is this feature phone. Uh, it's it doesn't even have a touch screen. Uh, and so I don't get addicted to it. I don't know about you, <laughs> but um, I, I find touch screen uh, very addictive and I, I don't really like being addicted to the surface. Uh, and so being a feature phone, it, I deliberately um, restrict my input bandwidth uh, to this device so that this device um, probably will never, if I manage my attention well, have the sufficient bits about my preferences to make the kind of exploratory judgments uh, or interpretations uh, that, that uh, you've just described it, which is uh, in technical terms, a blended volition of my different uh, moments or across my communities and so on. Uh, so, and when it try to wildly guess my preferences, uh, extrapolating my volition, because my input bits to it is so low, it invariably gets it very wrong, even uh, hilariously wrong. And so I will not pay much attention to it. Uh, and so this is kind of like wearing a, a medical mask. Um, this protects, um, not, I'm not talking about the biological germs and viruses, uh, but I'm using it as an analogy. Uh, I use, for example, the Facebook feed eradicator, which is like a, a mental medical mask. If you install this plugin, it, re it removes the Facebook feed from the Facebook app, from the website. Uh, and so everything that are autonomous, that is to say, if you intentionally do, do it, that's still possible. You can still do search, uh, view live streams or whatever, but all the unpredictable part, that those that pushes your emotional or dopamine or whatever buttons, these disappears and replace it with a Zen saying or a Adler saying or whatever saying. Uh, and so what I'm trying to say is that uh, before the society developed the norm of counter spawn of people flagging things as spawn, there's been things like uh, spam assassin, uh, for lack of a better name, uh, things that you can install by yourself, like a personal protective equipment. And finally, people figure out the norm around spam. And then nowadays, we don't worry about spam mail that much. Yeah, and because we understand that our attention is too precious to give to the spammers. And so I think it is uh, either a vicious cycle of you giving it more attention and the scammers have more bits to work with, or if you deny them the initial contact and then 
you protect you and your own community from the ripple effects. And once the infodemic have a R value under one, then these uh, bad ideas or uh, malign ideas uh, will not spread. And even if uh, so-called pro-social ideas, if it's kind of uh, hacking into our automated system, will be kept away because we will have sufficient room to breathe by our own conscious systems, which is the human mind's moderation system uh, in theory. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit in the conversation um, and I think shift over, given the current uh, COVID crisis, to talk about some of the global problems uh, that, that we're worried about. And Yuval, you have, you have three uh, on your list, AI, climate change, and uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, I'm not sure if you've added uh, pandemics onto that list, um, but uh, one of the remarkable things about this crisis um, has been uh, Taiwan's exceptional uh, performance here in terms of suppressing the virus without a lockdown and without community spread. Um, and, you know, it's a, it is a national narrative and a success to Taiwan, but it's a global problem. Um, so Audrey, my question for you is, um, what was the narrative of Taiwan's success? Do you think that um, it was a shared nationalist identity um, that, that pulled the Taiwanese together? Or do you think it was a uh, shared participation in solving the problem? And what can we extrapolate uh, around the world and uh, to, to replicate the success? There's actually uh, two crises at the same time. There is the pandemic, which is the biological one. And then there is the anxiety and fear and outrage and conspiracy theories and panic buying that uh, is collectively referred to as the infodemic. Uh, a, um, um, a good analogy uh, is that if those um, ideas of conspiracy theory, uh, they if you do not put out the vaccines of mind, that is to say, deliberative, uh, intentional communication materials uh, of basic scientific understanding, then people would suffer actually from a, a epistemic uh, void because they don't know really what's going on and they tend to fill in whatever the mental projection is, which tend to divide people more and make things even worse, right? Uh, and so in Taiwan, in very early on, we established the fast, fair, fun principles. And I talk about fast, right? Anyone who care uh, enough about uh, asking anything about the uh, counter pandemic strategy can call 192 and get their questions answered or the journalists will ask their questions in a much more elaborate way and get the daily 2 p.m. briefing understanding but even uh, that is not sufficient to quell people's fear for example about the lack of protective uh, gears and protective um, masks uh, we had a very early on a panic buying of medical masks when it was first distributed in convenience stores and pharmacies and uh, there was a civic technology Technologist with the name Howard Wu uh, in Tainan City developed this very simple idea. Um, he coded uh, a map on which that uh, he invites his friends and families to report which parts of uh, the city still have the mask in store, uh, in stock. So you can see the green uh, ones are the ones that still have mask in stock, and the red ones are the ones that have run out of stock. So just by this very simple gesture, um, he made sure that people uh, can self-report uh, where um, can they spend less time queuing needlessly, and then they can queue fruitfully. Uh, but he didn't anticipate this get national press attention, uh, and so uh, he very quickly had to sh shut the website down because he owed Google uh, because he used the Google Map API, uh, 20k US dollars uh, after just two days. Uh, and so he had to uh, shut it down. But uh, one of the people using his app was me. And so I talked to our premier, our uh, prime minister, and say we need to trust citizens with open data. And I think this is uh, one of the most interesting thing in Taiwan's history of building open data and open APIs in that when we switched to ration the mask, through the pharmacies, anyone can use their single payer national health uh, card, which covers 99.99% of Taiwanese population. Um, they can get those masks uh, and at nearby pharmacy. And that is a machine to machine system that publish the stock level of every pharmacy by every 30 seconds. And more than 100 different civic technologists developed maps, uh, chatbots, voice assistants, and so on. So it become essentially a distributed ledger 
in which that you can only update every 30 seconds, but without any uh, possibility of go back in time to change the numbers. And if people queue in line, uh, finally get their three masks per week at a time or nine masks per uh, two weeks uh, later on, uh, they expect after a couple of minutes to see in their phone that the stock level of that pharmacy would deplete by nine or 10 if they are a child. If it doesn't deplete or if rather increases, then they will just call 1922 right there and report this anomaly uh, to the CECC. And I spend the time to talk about this in detail because this captures, I think, what's at the root of the idea of a data collaborative. It's everybody holding each other accountable, everybody ensuring that there really is a fair distribution because they can witness by themselves and independent analysts can write more dashboards to show there's an oversupply in certain areas, undersupply in certain areas. Uh, there's people who work very long hours so they cannot collect a pharmacy. So we have to work with convenience store that open 24 hours a day. And it's already an international narrative because the most after we developed this code, which is all open source, by the way, uh, people in South Korea use the Taiwan model to convince their government that publishing the number every week or every day at the end of the day is not enough. You have to do a real-time API just like Taiwan did. And so the first uh, mass rationing availability map in South Korea was written by Fin Jian Kyung in Tainan, in Taiwan. Even though he doesn't speak Korean, he speaks JavaScript, uh, which is what's uh, important here. Uh, and so this enabled a new breed of civic technologists who work like civil engineers because more than uh, half a um, population, 10 million people, use their work. And so the fairness of all kinds, I think, is at its core. And at this moment, there's more than 90% of people who have used our mass rationing system and the remaining team, maybe they have already plenty of mass in storage uh, before the pandemic. They can also use that uh, app to dedicate uh, their uncollected quota to international friends uh, for humanitarian aid. So you can see actually 300,000 people's names in Taiwan can help that us. Uh, that's dedicated more than 5 million medical masks internationally. And you see uh, when high level officials start wearing this mask that prints made in Taiwan, uh, then people approach us and say, oh, we also want the blueprint that you can automate the production of 2 million masks a day in a small automated factory. And we also share the blueprints to many other jurisdictions as well. And so the fairness is definitely not just national, it is really an international perspective. So that's a fair pillar of fast, fair and fun. I, 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 uh, Taiwan is also on the climate change, which is an, another obvious global externality, has also had an interesting um, innovation, social innovation. Um, Audrey, you have, can you maybe tell us a little bit about the distributed sensors um, operated by citizens and run on a distributed ledger? Um, is that a solution we can also? Yeah, definitely. Um, the mask map uh, were able to be prototyped so quickly because there was already another map uh, called the air map uh, that's already uh, in place. So people in Taiwan voluntarily joined this distributed ledger and basically dedicate their school balcony or whatever to measure the uh, climate, to measure, for example, air pollution levels and so on and upload it to the civil IoT system, which is powered by distributed ledger technology. And what this means is that uh, if you live in a place uh, with some air pollution and you want to know whether it's from mobile, immobile, or overseas sources, um, you reach not for uh, the like 100 or so very high precision weather stations uh, in the country, but rather to your primary schools and uh, uh, interesting um, observations by even high schoolers uh, in their uh, data stewardship classes using those very cheap, less than 100 US dollars, um, airboxes and connected to the 4G network, which is uh, 16 US dollars per month for unlimited data connection everywhere in Taiwan, because we have broadband as a human right. And all of this enabled this kind of collective intelligence that uh, contributes to climate science. And because all the data are then at least one copy of the ledger is in the National High Speed Computing Center, the NCHC, which is a top 20 supercomputer in the world, uh, top 10 if 
if you count the energy uh, carbon footprint. But in any case, um, this uh, supercomputer would then be able to take any junior high schooler's code and uh, if it's a better code to predict uh, the air pollution or to predict the climate model and things like that, it would automatically be able to access the entire civil IoT system without this junior high schooler have to download any data to their personal computer. So this, in a sense, is democratizing uh, even very basic things like climate research and climate science to the citizen scientists. That's, again, another uh, application of our fairness principle, and that's why we can get a mass map running so quickly. Yuval, does this make you more optimistic about these global challenges that we face? Yeah, I think that with many of the, these global challenges, so the, the solution has to be global, but of course it's rooted, it's based in individual countries. The most important thing is not to fall into the trap of uh, thinking that there is a contradiction between nationalism and globalism and that we need to choose. There is no contradiction. Nationalism is about loving your compatriots, not about hating foreigners. And in many situations, like in this pandemic or with global climate change, if you really love your compatriots and you want to take care of them, you have to cooperate with foreigners. So to be a good nationalist, you also uh, have to be a globalist. There is no contradiction. And I think we are seeing it with initiatives like uh, the one we just heard in, in, in Taiwan. And also a very important thing is that some people think that to deal with these emergencies, whether the pandemic or global uh, climate change, we need some kind of authoritarian regime that will tell everybody what to do. Otherwise, there is no way to reach a consensus. But the example of Taiwan proves the opposite. And not just Taiwan. In this pandemic, it's true that authoritarian PRC have dealt with the epidemic better than the democratic USA, but they are not the only examples. Many of the countries which have dealt with the epidemic the best, whether it's in East Asia, like Taiwan and South Korea, whether it's New Zealand or Greece or Germany, they are democracies because generally, a well-informed and self-motivated population is far more efficient than an ignorant and policed population. With a well-informed population in democratic countries, instead of wasting resources on policing the people, you can actually benefit from their initiatives, and this is the best way forward. So we're actually coming to the end of our time here. So I think I will <clears throat> just ask a final question. Um, and that is on narratives for the future. So Yuval, you are a medieval historian looking at the mm -hmm. future. And Audrey, you are a technologist hacking the present. Uh, how do we develop that new shared story for the future without erasing our unique and individual attributes and differences uh, to solve these global problems? and can we usher in a new renaissance? And what's the narrative of that renaissance? Audrey, I'll start with you. Well, certainly. Um, for uh, many people uh, who worry about um, Taiwan's future, I will start with, with the island. Um, people often ask me, where is Taiwan going? Uh, what uh, are we going as a nation, as a country? And I often say that uh, it's very predictable the tip of Taiwan, the peak of Taiwan, uh, the Savia uh, in indigenous language or Pandok Benung uh, or the Jade Mountain uh, grows every year two centimeters, sometimes three centimeters. Uh, and so we're growing toward the sky. We're growing skyward. And that's a geological answer. Uh, but why do uh, the peak of Taiwan grows? That's because we're caught uh, between the Eurasian plate on one side and the Philippine Sea plate on the other. And they bump into each other all the time, um, causing endless earthquakes. And because of that, uh, we learn to make our not our own buildings resilient to the 
earthquakes, but also are um, ideascape uh, resilient. Uh, in Taiwan, you can get uh, a lot of people, uh, not just academicians, but everyday practitioners, arguing for a PRC-style authoritarian control over data. You can get people arguing equally strong about a social infrastructure, GDPR-style, protecting uh, the person's best privacy interest against the surveilling state uh, from the European uh, thought points. Or, or you can uh, get people arguing, again, very strongly uh, from the US-based uh, viewpoint of basically a asset oil extraction-based uh, uh, idea around data and so on. And so all of these ideas coexist in Taiwan. And just as in the very beginning when I said we legalized uh, marriage equality by legalizing the bylaws and not the in-law Loss, we always managed to find innovations that captures the common values out of the different positions. And that, I think, is the true vision of sustainability, of working for the benefit of uh, homo sapiens um, seven generations down the line, because that's what matters. Uh, and what doesn't matter is the kind of zero-sum games that people play at this present point using their own viewpoint. And Taiwan benefits from those plural viewpoints each, each with their own AI sidekicks, I'm sure. Uh, and that uh, actually frees us from this dominating, overarching narrative, uh, the same way as when we have more than 20 national languages. And so I actually think that this Taiwan model is not uh, confined to Taiwan. We can see many similarly minded people uh, that looks past behind zero sum games in various different ways. Radical exchange, for example, uh, works with the market power, but for the social benefit, uh, or the other way around, you don't know. But the idea is that it looks past the, the traditional divides uh, between like the false dichotomies and see them rather as different dimensions that you can develop on both dimensions and reach a higher um, um, plane of existence, if you will. Uh, and I think that is uh, also humanity's future. We will benefit from the plurality of civilizations and indeed grow skyward. I would say that you know, humans are storytelling animals. We rule this planet because we are the only animal, as far as we know, that can create imaginary stories and believe them. And this is the key for cooperation among humans. We cooperate because we believe in imaginary stories about gods and nations and money, uh, even though these things exist only in our own imagination, even only in our own mind. And this is not bad. This is the, the, the bedrock of almost everything we, we do. I mean, money obviously has no objective value. It's only here that money has value in contrast to say a banana that has an objective value, I can, I can eat it and it sustains me. But it's not bad, without money, we couldn't have trade networks like we have today. The key thing is to create stories that serve us without being enslaved by them. I mean, the danger that humans constantly face is that they come up with some big story to help organize society, and then they forget. It's just a story we invented. They get trapped in it and they start harming themselves or others in the name of the story. You know, if you think about something simple like a game, like football, so obviously we invented football and it's fun. It's nothing bad about it. But if you start beating up or killing people because you lost a game, then, then that, that's a problem. And it's the same when we look to the future. Um, we need to create new stories to unite humankind, but we have to be extremely careful to remember that it's all done in order to alleviate suffering. Uh, I would say that the test of reality, reality is still there behind all the codes and all the stories, reality is still there. And I would define reality by suffering. If you want to know whether something is real or not, whether the hero of your story you believe in, in the nation or in some god or in a corporation or whatever, you want to know if it's real, ask whether it can suffer. Now, a nation cannot suffer. Money can't suffer. When the dollar loses its value, it doesn't suffer. Uh, computers too, code, as far as we know, doesn't suffer. So whatever story we create in the 21st century in order to deal with the new challenges 
we should constantly ask ourselves this question, who actually suffers? And remember that everything we do is, all, is in order to alleviate that suffering. Then we are on, on safe ground. That's, that's a very powerful way uh, to interpret, which is very uh, uh, enlightening. Uh, and as a oyster vegan, uh, I would not uh, go into a debate of whether oysters are real or not, uh, of whether they can suffer or not. Uh, but I, I think what, what makes sense really uh, is to empower the uh, people, and by people I mean any being that can suffer, uh, to empower people closest to the suffering. And if we keep code to empower people who are closest to the pain, who are indeed suffering, then I would argue that they then become uh, hackers in the civic hacking sense, that they can um, not be restrained by their biology, because it's Pride Month after all, or restrained uh, by their uh, social standing or even other old stories that people merely repeat but do not uh, co-create, right? Uh, and then being liberated from those old stories, they become story we that can then determine uh, a better destiny for uh, everyone in the sapient kind, uh, if that's a word. Uh, but I, I think uh, if we concentrate power to the people who are feeling the least suffering, people who are or already uh, enjoy too much uh, hedonistic lifestyles, then we are in real danger because uh, even though hed hedonism is not zero sum, it tends to self-reinforce itself into a self-trapping cycle. So um, I would also say that to hack or to be hacked is not a question that is an individual level, rather it's on a society level and we can keep looking at, just like Gini Index, we can look at the Code Weaver, Story Weaver's Index of how much individuals who are closest to the pain and suffering can co-create a norm and a code that we're living by. Yeah, I, I fully support that. That's a very, very good way of putting that. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yuval. Thank you, Audrey. Audrey, you have this beautiful quote uh, which is sort of your own story. Would you mind sharing that on the, the singularity is near, but uh, I won't say it. I'll let you know. Sure, sure. Okay. All right. All right. So yeah, it, it's my job description, actually. Uh, so three and a half years ago, when I first become digital minister, people often confuse digital with IT, uh, information technology, or ICT plus communication technology. I keep telling people technology is talking to machines and digital is about forming a new possibility in societies. But it's hard to distinguish those two apart. So I wrote a poem or a prayer, really as my job description. So I will read that um, by uh, Puja's request. And it goes like this. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Hmm. Very beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Yuval. I hope this conversation has been enlightening for both of you. It's certainly been an honor and very humbling experience for me. And uh, I wish you both a wonderful end to Pride Month. Mm -hmm. Yes, live long, prosper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>